All right, everybody. Uh, welcome to the We're Libertarians Book Club discussion, the uh, monthly discussion we're going to have for our Patreon members only. So if you are a member of Patreon, or actually if you're listening to this, you are a member of Patreon. So thank you so much for your support. It's because of your support we're able to do fun stuff like this. And uh, this was in high demand. People wanted to see what we were reading and learn what we learned. And uh, it, uh, our first book was called Them, Why We Hate Each Other, and How to Fix It by Ben Sass. Uh, and we have here with us, we have uh, Christy Avery, who uh, you'll know. She's uh, one of the big reasons We're Libertarian Stays Alive. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've got Hadley here from the book club. Now, if you want to join the book club, it's on Goodreads. That's how uh, we get to know great people like Hadley. And we've got... Uh, Jacob here as well. I think he may have stepped away just a brief moment to uh, help with the kiddos, but he's going to come back here. Uh, Jacob, you'll know from the research team. Um, yeah, so uh, we're just going to have a nice little discussion here. So uh, let's start broadly. Uh, what were what were some of your guys' expectations coming into the book? Uh, for me, I, I had no idea exactly. I guess I was just... Uh open to researching a little bit more. I've been listening to you guys for about a year and a half now, and I wanted to start um, kind of <clears throat> educating myself a little bit more. So I thought this was, I mean, obviously this is what you guys re recommended, and I thought it was a good start. Um, but it was kind of uh, interesting to learn about the clan mentality or the tribe mentality and how you uh, how everybody separates each other. So um, I, I had really nothing, no idea what we were getting ourselves into when I first started the book same <laughs> <laughs> the ditto the ditto jacob any expectations when you're coming into the book uh can you hear me yeah i hear you okay awesome uh none particularly um i knew very little about the senators going into this so i actually read up a little bit about his uh bio to kind of help out and um yeah um uh, enjoyed the book but no preconceived uh, biases going in See, when I heard Senator out of Nebraska, I was like, this is going to be terrible. I immediately just thought it was going to be a hick book. And uh, I was really glad to be proven wrong. But, uh, I mean, do you remember the, uh, oh, who was it, the guy who ran for, for Georgia, his campaign this season? I was just like, whenever I hear Republican from one of those, like, deep red states, I'm just like, ugh, this is going to be, this is going to be tough. But uh, I felt I felt like it was really eloquent, so... I guess let's let's start. What were, what was your biggest takeaway from the book? We'll go in the same order. Hadley, what what did you what was your biggest takeaway from the book? Uh, I guess the biggest takeaway I kind of put in the uh, uh, book club comments as well was, I think it's getting back to our, our local communities. We've gotten so nationalized almost. Um, everything is as we've seen over the last uh, actually weekend, uh, past weekend things gets blown up so quickly and everybody's got to choose a side. And uh, prior to it, you're just so focused on your, your community that you are a part of. And, you know, a lot of the national stuff, I mean, it mattered, but it wasn't as big of a deal and people weren't fighting over that. They're more concerned about getting funding for playgrounds or other local aspects that they can actually truly control. And um, I personally have been off of Facebook for, I think a year and a half year, somewhere in there, every once in a while I'll pop back on, but, uh, that so getting rid of that distraction of social media, and uh, because I don't know, nine times out of ten, I watch face or I go on Facebook, and I, I never feel any better getting off of Facebook. They're usually I'm more angry than I was when I went on. So uh, it, that's been a, a perfect release for me to get away from from that social media side. And that's one of those, and, and I will get to you, Christy. But that's one of those things I didn't even know you because I didn't know you from social media. Like that was any more real than anything else. But then we put up this book club and, and you found us and obviously you're a real person and you're a participant. And so it's like, oh my gosh, I can actually meet people outside of social media like <laughs> that I have mm -hmm. common interests with. Like just not one of those, I, I think in my millennial brain, just not one of those things that I'm used to used to doing. So, uh, okay, go ahead, Christy, your biggest takeaway. Uh, I didn't make it to the end of the book, so... <laughs> That's our uh, biggest takeaway so far. Just uh, cutting yourself away from social media and 
trying to con- connect with actual people instead of just people on the computer, which all you guys are just images on the computer. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so do as we, we, we say, not as we do here, but yeah. Exactly. Uh, exactly. How about you, Jacob? <laughs> Yeah, I, did. I thought the uh, biggest key takeaway for me was um, he spells it out about how we're becoming, you know, part of a team and all of a sudden, you know, it's your team against their team. And he kind of puts in some words that kind of really spell it out. It makes a lot of sense as you're reading it. You know, when you kind of went through the first third of the book, you really have a hard time disagreeing with anything because it was like pretty like pretty generic in the first third where it's like, hey, look, we're divided. And, you know, I think 95 percent of people would agree with that. Um, and then, you know, towards the end of the book is when he got a little bit more specific, but, uh, one key takeaway I took the biggest one was just talking about being community centric and how I, he made some comment about, you know, most of us don't even know our neighbors, you know, two doors down or, you know, the next door over. And I was like, yeah, that's actually pretty true. You know what I mean? So, um, then I guess the last key takeaway was his, um, discussion on technology where he was talking about how, you know, there's the cons of it is, you know, like your echo chamber and, you know, you're less involved in your community and more involved in, you know, these online like disputes where, you know, like I have to like die on this hill for my team, you know? And yeah. Those are my biggest key takeaways I took from it. Yeah. And mine touches on, on that a little bit, especially in the concept of, uh, he talked about it early, but the concept of like what social capital actually is. And this is what my biggest takeaway was, was just, the, the idea of capital is it's something that you can use, right? That you actually turn it into something. And I think about, so, and I never really thought about social capital before. Like I know a lot of people, but what, what, good, what is it worth? What can I actually turn it into? It might feel like it's worth a lot because you get a lot of likes and interactions and shares. And I won't lie, even when I post something and I, I've limited myself to social media after reading this book as well. But, you know, I post one thing a day, and that one thing that I post, I won't lie, when I check the next day, if it gets a lot of shares, I'm like, yay, but what what good does that do me? And he talked early about some of these dying clubs, um, specifically the Kiwanis Club, and it's funny because I used to manage at a restaurant where we had a Kiwanis Club that came in regularly, and they're a bunch of old dying breed, you know, do-gooders, and I'm like, well... How good, how good does it really do? But the thing is, is when they needed a ride to the airport, yeah, they might be old. It might not be fun. There might only be seven of them as opposed to the, you know, 700 or however many people you know on social media. But they gave each other rides to the airports. They talked about helping each other out when their cars would break down. Like, that's actual social capital. That's something they were actually able to turn in to something of worth. Whereas I have hundreds of worthless interactions on social media every day that I'll never be able to turn into capital. And how many times do I look at these clubs and, and you know, I might laugh at them because they so small and they seem so igni- insignificant, but they're actually doing something both in the community and for each other. So, I mean, let, let's take away the structure of I ask a question and how does the class feel really quick. Let's just talk about subjects in the book that you just wanted to discuss. Anybody. Well, real quick, just to caveat off of uh, what you're talking about in the terms of helping each other out, uh, me and my wife have this like funny thing where we talk about you know how close we are to a friend of ours or something, and one of the go-to questions we always joke around, but it's true is like, you know, if you got a flat and you didn't have the means to fix it on your own, would you call this person? And there's like a certain like circle of friends or group that you would, and a certain circle that you know but you wouldn't. You know what I mean? So it's kind of yep. like. That's me and my wife's own like metric. Like, yeah, you know, he's a great guy. I would call him if I was in a bind, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, whereas opposed to he's a great guy. I'd have a beer with him, but you know, you know, life depends on the side of the road. I'm stuck. I wouldn't really call him. So there's, you know, levels of community with that. So just to sidebar what you mentioned earlier. That's a great rule of thumb. Yeah, I agree. And I think, um, he, he started talking about technology a little bit too, if I believe in the book. Um, bear with me. It's been about a month or so since I finished it. Uh, so I'm a little rusty and I've been diving into the libertarian mind. Um, but uh, it, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with Simon Sinek as well. I mean, he's done some TED Talks and other things. And, and it's amazing the uh, 
uh, Hody had mentioned, you go on and you see, oh, I got so many likes. Yes. And it's those constant like uh, serotonin hits um, that it's it's pulling us in. And I thought that one of the very interesting parts was that uh, he mentions all these tech leaders curb their own kids use of their products. So it's the, uh, as he said, the saying, uh, don't get high on your own supply. So they know what they're pushing is bad, but obviously it's like, well, you know, well, it's good for uh, certain parts of it. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, walls built itself up and, and other areas, but I think that there's that, uh, underlying undertone of that is it's really bad. So, um, for those that haven't seen, I think this watching Simon Sinek is really good and, and talking about it. And he was also talking about, you know, we got these on a, we go to dinner with people and we're supposed to be interacting with them one-on-one -on -one and we keep our cell phone right on, on the table and keep checking that like it's more important than the people around us. Um, and I've tried as hard as I can to make sure that if I do that, the phone's always in my pocket or it's not around me, uh, which is very difficult. And you usually got to walk through the house and you, Oh, no, nope, nothing. Nobody texts me. No, no, no notification or anything else like that. But, uh, that was something that's kind of hit home to me that I've been trying to pay attention to even, even over the last handful of years. Um, because I think it, it can just take control. And I usually see that I end up wasting more time looking at the news on my phone real quick or, or just scanning through it. And you just, Oh, what I do the last hour? I don't know. I didn't do anything productive. Um, so I think that's part of using technology to our advantage and not allowing it to control our lives. Yeah, it's supposed to be yeah. like a useful tool, and so many times it that I, you the, you use the use for it like one percent of the time, and then ninety nine percent of the time you're actually wasting time with it as opposed to like using it as the tool like it should function as. I, uh, I, I, I mean, have any of you guys made like changes since reading the book? I mean, Hadley, you were kind of already on top of. Of change of the social media thing already pr going into the book, but is it like is there anything any of you guys have done since reading the book? Because I know I've made some changes. No, nothing. I wasn't already kind of working on, so it was just kind of a good like validation of like you know had they talked about the um, using the phone at dinner. You know, we've been trying to like cut back on that a lot. Thankfully, we started right before the book. So it was kind of like, okay, like, I feel, you know, like, it was a good, like, you know, you're in the right direction. It, you know, not, not that I'm good at it. I, I still went terrible, but it was a good affirmation on that. Um, the biggest reason why uh, I try to use the phone less and less is because uh, something that kind of stuck with me last summer was uh, when you talk about using your phone or just kind of like acknowledging who's around you and, you know, kind of tying back to the community and technology. You know, when you think about having dinner and you're distracted, you know, not giving the attention to your wife or, you know, your parents or whatever, you know, like imagine yourself, you know, 20 years from now, you know, how much would you pay to have that like dinner with your dad or mom again? You know, for many people, for like me, my dad passed away, it'd be priceless to have dinner with him again. So, you know, if you if it's priceless 20 years from now, then act like it's priceless now. You know what I mean? Like that that's kind of what, what hit me the most. And, you know, kind of just going Hadley said about you know, that phone and that community, like, hey, like, you know, put it down, talk to those around you, even if, you know, you're trying to build that community, like, if you're out somewhere by yourself, you know, don't pull your phone out, have a conversation with somebody in line about, you know, whatever, it doesn't have to be anything crazy, but, you know, the little things like that, but it's just kind of an affirmation, I think, for me. Yeah, the, uh, Christy, I know you're shy. Do you got anything to add? <laughs> um, Something that I'd been thinking about for a while is attending local meetings in the area. And I went to like a, a community wide neighborhood association meeting the other day and it was really very interesting. And, you know, it's, I can see how they struggle to get more people involved with the group, but there were a lot of people that showed up. So that's encouraging. Um, I'm not ready to put my social media aside. So <laughs> I will, I do try to limit it when I'm, you know, out to eat with people or stuff like that, but. I don't do that very often, so it's not a problem. <laughs> but so you brought up two things that I really wanted to get in depth. One is having real life interactions as opposed to social media interactions. And that's something that I I don't want to downplay communication through social media. There's a reason it exists. I still believe social media is a tool. Obviously, Wall still uses it heavily. We 
we are so <clears throat> we are so able to outreach through this social media. However, the majority of our outreach is people doing it for us and sharing it for us and saying, hey, you should really check these guys out. This really improved my life. And that's like a positive interaction. But that's such a low percentage of how much social media is like important. I think his lesson in the book, even the rule he made for his family, something that I made a change in doing was something that he said, let's do social media between this and this time. And... And so he said that, that that's kind of the way he limited it. He didn't have to go cold turkey. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that, Hadley, but he didn't have to go cold turkey. He just said, you know, let's, let's limit it between this and this time. You can get any quality interactions that you need to get out in that time. And then after the day, you're not distracted. Um, Jacob, you brought up that thing about wanting those dinners with your dad back. And that really was what struck me. I am, my girlfriend has kids. Um, that aren't mine. It's hard to bridge that gap sometimes. And it just made me think over and over how many times I'm just a side character in their story. And my hope someday is that I'll be their stepdad. And they will know me only before this is that guy who was like doing weird podcasts and on his phone a lot. And I would have so much more of a leg up going into it. And it would increase my cr credibility so much to be able to to be able to put aside those times of meaningless interactions and gain a real interaction with her. And it's hard mentally because I have 500 people that are viewing my things that I want them to, I mean, I have over a, a thousand friends at this point and 500 are probably pretty active with my posts, you know, to say, ah, oh, like what you said is awesome. And all that positive reinforcement that I get is it worth a dinner with my future stepdaughter to say, hey, I just really care about you? It doesn't give me the same serotonins, but ultimately that's absolutely more valuable than anything I could post on social media that they'll probably hear from somebody else anyway. Sorry, that's, that's, that was a rant, but, uh, but yeah, go, go from there. <laughs> yeah, and, and Jacob, um, first off, sorry for... Uh, the loss of your father, but I know that is something that um, had been brought up to me that um, I've been trying to do personally was somebody said, you know, what I started to do was uh, have a monthly breakfast or lunch with my father and it was scheduled and, you know, and I've been trying to do that with my mother and father because I get so uh, caught up with work and I work a lot of hours and having a, a newborn and, and that aspect, but just taking that hour, hour and a half to set aside monthly or biweekly or however you can do it and just sitting down and, you know, just talking. And, um, the person that told me they started doing that, they realized that, you know, 10 years later when their father had passed, uh, they had gotten this many more hours of interaction with them that they hadn't had before. Um, so obviously with life, it gets busy and things happen, but you know, I've been trying to stick to that as much as possible. And, uh, I guess, but the other part on the, the social media, some of the tough things is even though friends that you have locally, sometimes some of those interactions are through social media and party invites and all those other things. So sometimes you're just not even, people don't realize because my page is still technically there. I just never do it. They'll look at a picture and it's from a year and a half ago. I haven't posted anything, um, <laughs> but then you can actually miss out on things because you're not on social media. People are inviting you to local parties or get togethers and you, you miss out. But, um, I think just a lot of more one-on-one, -on -one, face to face uh, interaction. Really, at the end of the day, it's kind of like who's going to show up when, when you're not around. Yeah, you, know, you pass. Who's going to be there for you? And many of the people that you interact with on social media on a daily basis, it's going to go just going to be the next day, and they're not even going to recognize that you're gone. And, and that's such the worry is that you're going to be missing out on something so important. When in reality, this guy is a U.S. senator. And he barely hits social media at all. And here I am all over social. I mean, if social media was how you win elections, we'd have Austin Peterson. Libertarians would be like half of the house. I mean, we'd just be in great shape. When in reality, you're actually missing out on the real stuff by being too engaged by social media. It's a tool, but it's not everything. Also, we should welcome Chris Spangle to the call. How you doing, Chris? Spangle! Hello, guys. How are you? 
Doing great. Hey, we're talking about uh, changes. I know you read the book. We're talking about changes that you made after reading the book. I think for me, it was mostly an awareness thing. I mean, it was um, like that first part, part one, I think was so impactful in understanding kind of what the issues were, both with loneliness and then also with work. Uh, and, and I think it gave me a better context to what is happening now and why everything feels so crazy and a little, a good insight into the past. I mean, it's, as I was discussing it with my boss, he said, you know, there was a study years ago that said people built, started building back porches instead of front porches. Um, so for me, it was a lot about awareness as to what might be the issue, but then Mittens, Mittens agrees. She thinks <laughs> the book was great. Um, I don't know if you can hear her meowing. Uh, so, you know, that's why I want to, uh, when I get some time to sit down and put together the plan and start building little community groups. I think if you look at what like Boss Hog of Liberty has built around, they, they took a common interest and then have gone out into the community and brought in all kinds of people that would never interact with libertarians or where libertarians wouldn't interact with business owners and Republicans and Democrats. And like, I saw somebody yesterday at an event and they own Jack's donuts and they were like, wow, boss hog of Liberty is so great. So I want to do more of that. I think it really, uh, you know, I've always thought about something like we are libertarians as how do I get more people to engage online and build online community. And after reading that book, I realized the goal shouldn't be creating online community because that's part of the problem. It's that we're not engaging with people that aren't like us. We're engaging with people who are exactly like us and we're siloing ourselves in Facebook groups and we're neglecting the people that are around us. So it just gave me a a motivation to kind of make 2019 more about finding community and building community through this in my own life. Uh, I was involved in a meeting at some point last year where it was a group of young professionals and uh, we, we met once and it was great. And I was like one of two white guys in the room out of 25 people. And it was a lot of people that weren't like me, but in the meeting, I realized how much we had in common. I think it was in the like, it was in the fall, I think. And maybe even spring. It was a long time ago, and we never really got back together. And so I sent the organizer a text about a, three weeks ago and said, hey, can we get back together? Can we do this again? Because here's a lot of people who are doing a lot of good things in their community. And in that meeting, I realized, like, oh, I have this talent or ability that can help them with this project, or I've got this platform that can help bring them some exposure um and i'm sitting there going wow this person's really interesting i want to you know have them come on the podcast and so we kind of i let that out of like the 25 30 people that went to that meeting none of us have really made an effort to do something again you know this person put this initial meeting together but then the rest of us just kind of let that thing fail instead of building Anybody want a cat? <laughs> because I'm so annoyed right now. So I, it's very quiet here usually. And so when I start talking on the phone, Mittens gets very uh, engaged and she's irritating me. You know, oh, I'll build you, a, I'll put you in a community outside with the other stray cat. Um, so, so like that's a very real instance of, wow, there's, there's a group of people that are in my city that are my age that are doing cool things that I had access to. And I was just going to let that go. And I can take the responsibility to encourage the organizer to have a second meeting. And so we're setting something up for March. You know, it's not something that benefits me in any way directly, but it's a group of interesting people that where we could benefit each other by building some sort of coalition. So I've just been thinking more and more about my own life since reading the book and you know, I'm, I think I have a pretty healthy social life, but I also spend a lot more time alone and a lot more time on my phone than I ever did before I got a smartphone. And I think this book was a good check to kind of go, hey, are these behaviors good at, are, are these healthy behaviors? Because 
Like I've now come to see the phone and social media as something that is not necessarily all bad. You don't need to get rid of all of it. And with my career, I can't, but you can't eat potato chips every day for every meal. You have to, you can have, it's like, I have to treat social media and the phone and my digital life in the way that I treat Coca-Cola. Like I will occasionally get a Coke and I'll drink maybe a quarter of it instead of the way that I used to approach it, which was drink three or four Cokes at a, at a meal at a restaurant. You know, it's, it's like a, it has to be a smaller part. Now I'm working on it. Uh, I'm not doing well at it the last month, but you know, that's, I think the point is that everything's a practice. Everything is your, it's one step, one foot in front of the other. And and, you know, I think we've I guess it really hit me in reading this book, how much we've let those social skills atrophy. Uh, and I think the people that are involved in We Are Libertarians, I think we'd all agree. And we're some of the more social people that I know in my life. Like, you know, Hody's a very social person. Hody's always engaged. Christy, ultimate joiner, you know, but we're still like not as social as maybe as our grandparents were. Um, So how do we start to like, it's tough because like I just came from the gym and I have barely worked out for six months and I've let all that progress atrophy. And so now I'm starting over and it's really tough and it's discouraging. And I think reading this book kind of felt the same way a little bit in that, wow, to get back to where we need to be as a society it's going to take a lot of effort and that's, that's a lot of effort and I'm tired. Uh, but <laughs> you just have to do it because, and the, and the other thing I think is as a libertarian in reading this book, it made me think a lot more about community and our responsibility as members of a community. And I, it's a very conservative way of thinking, you know, the difference between a libertarian and a conservative is libertarians are obsessed with the individual and conservatives are more obsessed with the community and conserving social norms. And I think that it was a healthy mental exercise to kind of read from the conservative perspective about problems and solutions, things like the family, you know, in that first part where he talks about the family, I think a lot of libertarians are really, uh, they don't want to talk like that because that makes it sound like you're a Bush conservative. But when you really get down to like the the Gates Foundation example that he used in the book, he said, you know, the Gates Foundation did all this research on why all this money was spent on education and nothing changed. And then they a former employee wrote like, duh, Bill, the one thing you didn't study was the family. And if you'd actually talk to teachers, they would tell you family means the most in terms of kids getting their homework done. You know, are is is the are the parents uh just trying to get the kid to obey or are the parents trying to teach the kid why they should obey uh so so i think as libertarians we think a lot in terms of no the government shouldn't do this but we don't think a lot of how would we do this if it weren't for the government and i think the reason that i really wanted to start with this book was to get libertarians thinking in that direction because the the great thing about the book was that it it shows you kind of like, hey, this is stuff that you'd have to do in a private society, and we have to do it in a society filled with government, you know? And so are you going to step up and build the social safety nets that exist if the government isn't there to provide those social safety nets? Because you can want, you can sit there and rail against the, uh, the lack of the government's authority to do things like welfare or, you know, WIX or food stamps or whatever, but what are you going to replace that with? And I don't think libertarians have that conversation enough. And so that's one reason that I kind of wanted to start with this book intentionally, as opposed to like a very libertarian book was just to show, Hey, what are we going to build after this? So that's, those are kind of my thoughts on, I I re-listened to it. I, I didn't retain a ton of the book the first time around, but the second time I've been listening the last few days, I also really have thought about media. I mean, uh, Hody, I think you were probably more impacted by the media portion, you know, with Sean Hannity and the conservative media kind of taking that one little extreme behavior. And I really think this, the conservative media does a lot more of this, where they take that one crazy example and they blow it into a thing. And then all of a sudden, 
the right is all up in arms over something that doesn't really matter because Sean Handy is leading with it every night at 9 p.m. And so it's made me think a little bit more about how I approach conservative media because I thought of it in terms of, well, this is good counterbalance, but now I think of it in terms of, is this important? Yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> I'm actually going to have a, I'm interviewing tonight for the show, a, uh, libertarian who considers himself a social justice warrior. And you think of the term mm -hmm. social justice warrior and you automatically think of terrible people. Like you automatically think of the extremes because that's what the conservative media media has told you what they are. Like but, like the girl the, with the bald head that was crying about over the, the hat. hat. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Right. Like she is such a but she's such an extreme and she's such a minority. Like even among social justice warriors, she's an extreme minority. Like, or I guess she's not even social justice warrior. Among the left or among people that, that don't like Trump, she's a minority. So it just, you brought up something else. And, well, you brought up a ton of things. We're going to turn this over to the group. One thing that I wanted to mention, you even talked about in one of your episodes about some of the monuments in Indiana and how they were built but without the government, built through all these groups, built by, by people that were involved with their communities. We could take away government. That doesn't mean we fix the culture that will all of a sudden start building these monuments back, that'll build these amazing architectural structures back because our culture just isn't in a place of community. So we keep attacking government, government, government. And I like that this book, even though it's written by a center, really goes after that culture, that you need to establish this first because I think, and I know it's not a libertarian who wrote it, but as a libertarian who wants to downsize slash get rid of the government, I need to understand that our culture needs to get in a place where we would be able to handle that first before they'll even accept changes like that. So uh, is there anything, Chris said a lot, guys. Let's have your input on some of the things that he said that, that you thought was impactful. Uh, I think uh, part of it is, and that's one of the things that attracted me to a wall was um, where we are socially now, you know, going to a, and, and, and bear with me, I'm, a, I'm pretty new on the libertarian idea and uh, libertarian mind is a great book for that. So uh, I've really been enjoying that, but to go from the society we've built to this point in time to a libertarian society, it's, it's just so far to go. So we, I think, um, and Chris, thanks. I know that you kind of chip away at it, that it's, it's, we can't make that change all at once. There's gotta be little things. So I think getting back out in the community. Yeah. If, if we just cut bait on, on the government and go back and fall on, on the community, where are we going to go? There's so much that we rely on from the government, um, from every little aspect. So it's really building up, uh, our communities, and getting out there and becoming, um, being the change that we want to see. You know, I think um, that's one of the things that I try to live with on every day is um, you can only control so much. And the one thing you can control is you and your response to anything. So, you know, be the change that you want to see. And we have to slowly, slowly build it up from there. Yeah, Mance Raider had a uh tweet that I saw today where he basically said, do any of us think that if Venezuela had a vote today that they wouldn't choose socialism, you know, even after what they've been through? And I don't know that I totally agree with that, but I think his, his point is well taken in that if, if, we, if we got control of everything, if let's say the collapsitarians had their, their dream and the society collapsed, like, do we think that the modern society wouldn't just build like when you have radio talk show hosts like Michael Smirkanish saying, I think national is, is national service a good idea. And then liber and then people on my Facebook wall are all going, you know, it probably is a good idea for us to have a national service. Well, that's the direct opposite of what the founding of America was about, you know, where you own your own body, you own your own time, labor, effort, and you are not controlled by the king. You know, but we have this conversation in America where – all of a sudden service is popular and you, you should be uh, mandated like a draft to participate in these projects. It's just crazy. So you have to change the culture. You have to change people's hearts and minds before you can change the government structure. We've seen that with gay marriage. We've seen that with civil rights. When the culture changes, 
through persuasion, then the government follows. And so if we can, that's part of why I started the podcast originally in 2012. I'd been so frustrated by how li- how poorly I was doing as a political operative in changing Indiana to be more libertarian that I wanted to start a podcast that would help me do that. So, so it's really the, and the only way that we're going to really do this is by changing is building communities, talking with different different people and getting them to go. I think, you know, the, the podcast that I just did with Alan Frank, like that's going to a new community of people and giving these ideas that they find revelatory or that challenges them. And then all of a sudden it's it's they go, you know, maybe I'm more libertarian than I thought. I didn't really know what that was. So by being engaged in our communities, we're going to make big changes. It's uh, our HOA. Uh, there's a meeting you can attend any month that you want to. They, of course, the uh, the people in charge of it themselves, who will always want the fees to be higher, always send about five people. My HOA, they, there's probably 300 people in the community, um, you know, or at least I, I guess 300 homes in the community, each of which could send any number of family members there. And if there were, they put it to a vote to increase the fees. And if more than five people from the community show up and they're like, I'm sick of these fees increasing, which we all are. We, anytime we, you check our HOA on social media, you'll get hundreds of complaints about them. But the one meeting you had to show up to, to get the fees down, you didn't show up to. Like it's that much, like it's so easy and I get it to stay home and whine about it. But then to go actually out and fix it, the one thing you had to do was just show up to this one meeting and it's like me and I get outvoted five to one every time because I'm the only one who shows up from the whole the whole thing. So why, my community can't. Why do you us. think let me ask, like why do you why do people not show up? Like I I don't buy the whole uh they're just busy thing. Like the oh people are just busy with their lives. Like that that's a bullshit excuse. Like I don't understand why people don't take that very simple effort and show up at a meeting like that if they're all that mad like why don't they like what what do you think the cause is i feel like they don't i they don't feel like they should have to they feel like the fees should just go down and they should not have to do anything and maybe maybe philosophically they're correct but that's just not the way the world works and i think it's that detachment from reality personally I think it's those that show up get are the ones that get things done. I mean, it's easy to stay home, you know, to get up and sometimes get out and do things that are uncomfortable. Uh, personally, I'm kind of an introvert. So even going to, uh, you know, for work to different events and stuff like that, it's not, I guess, fully enjoyable and it's draining on me a little bit, but that's how things get done. You know, you can't, um, the, the more and more, you complain about things and don't do anything. I mean, it doesn't really go anywhere. And then, um, I don't know. I think a lot of it is just kind of showing up to begin with and getting out there. Um, because it is easy to stay home and, and complain. Is it insecurity? Do we, is it laziness? Like I, I've always wondered if people don't show up because they, that social anxiety of showing up to a place that you don't like going to a city council meeting, you don't, you don't have friends there. You don't know anybody there. You're gonna feel weird sitting in the in the audience, like you think everybody's paying attention to you, but they're not. Like I've always wondered if maybe it's the anxiety of it that is really what is keeping people from joining things, which I also don't find to be a valid excuse. Like that's maybe it's part of that atrophied muscle where people are just not able to push through that anxiety of it. That's one thing that I thought maybe it could be. It's I would agree with that. There's a there's a social there's a social issue, and I find that even when I haven't practiced my social muscle for a few days, that my podcasts, even when I do the dailies, and I do them pretty regularly, but if I haven't talked to people within a few days, I get um, you know, like yeah. a lot, and that's and that's me as like a professional talker. Like, if I don't exercise that, 
I my quality goes significantly down. And I will notice that when I'm out in public. And I think other people know themselves well enough to know that it's easy when I type because I can be anything that I want on social media, type anything that I want, and there's no actual backlash against me. Maybe a couple angry reacts, but I don't care, you know. And and when it comes to actually being in person, there's no veil there. Nobody's going to coddle you and be like, you did your best or, you know, you, you said you said something pretty well. You know, they're going to say, no, that was not well spoken. We all disagree with you still. And that's the end. And so that that prowess of being actually be able to socialize verbally, I think there's maybe an awareness that they're not good at it or simply a knowledge that they won't be reinforced when they make a mistake, positively reinforced by anybody when they make a mistake, which you will get on social media and you won't get in real life. Yeah, I think a lot of people just want to be liked as well. So if you're putting yourself out there and, you know, if you're within your, your network of people that um, in your situation were complaining about the um, the rates, but now if you get outside of that little echo chamber and you step out, you know, you're not safe anymore. Um, so it it's it's fear of not being liked anymore as well, I think. I think a human in, as a human being, we all want to be liked to some degree. So you have to kind of get past that and un- understand why you're, why you're, bringing up your argument it's also fear of responsibility if you show up you might have to do something (laughs) and that'll cut in and and that will cut into your time of Mm self-gratification you know if if you have if you have responsibilities as a member of a community then that cuts into the time that you can play video games or that you can play candy crush or that you can you know sit at home and watch porn or something i don't know <laughs> like it, it, and i've been through it too where it's like uh if i show up to this meeting i'm gonna get a job because that's just my nature and i'm not gonna go huh. yeah and um i i think you do you know if you show up you usually you get a job and stuff like that but i know as much as i enjoy spending a whole weekend playing video games or doing anything else like that i know at the end of it and I think that it goes back to the social media aspect and the Facebook is I, I usually don't feel better at the end of it. Like sometimes every once in a while it's good, get your like your fix. Um, but usually you feel much better at the end of the day after you've uh, produced something. I mean, even like, I don't know, you go out and mow the yard or do your garden or something, you know, it's kind of a pain to go through it. You don't want to start it, but at the end you stand back and look at it and go, hmm, well, that, you know, that was very rewarding. You can sit down maybe have a beer afterwards and enjoy yourself for it. But um, so I think it's, you know, you got to get out there and and push yourself and you'll actually get more out of it. Well, I think he does a good job. I think he does a good job in that second part of the first of part one and where he's talking about jobs and how important your job is to your identity and Mm -hmm. how we're feeling anxiety about our changing roles, you know, from 20 years at a company to multiple gigs I think that nobody goes around bragging about how their identity is. I play video games or I'm, you know, maybe they brag about being first in their fantasy football league or, or I've watched 17 hours of ESPN or, you know, my, in my case, I, I had a really good tweet last night. You know, there, I think these little time wasters or these little things that we do, like, I think it is important to like, let your brain zone out every once in a while, but, these little things that are kind of meaningless in terms of identity don't necessarily give us the fulfillment that achieving something within a community might give you, you know, it, it, that face to face community can really help build up your self esteem and give you meaning, you know, as, as coach says, he got meaning out of being impactful in other people's lives. And, the fear of responsibility is actually the fear of, you know, not finding meaning by being responsible to other people and having wins. I I don't know if I'm totally making sense, but I think we rob ourselves when we let the anxiety win. Like, and I go back to physical health. It's sort of the same thing. Well, I choose not to go to the gym on mostly a daily basis, but that's not the, that's not a win. Like that's not a positive and I'm robbing my future self of good health, you know, and eventually all that adds up to just terrible health 
and being sick and dying quicker. <laughs> so you that moment of self gratification doesn't necessarily help you in the long run. I, I think what you're saying makes total sense. I mean, we've got five people on this call that are go getters, podcast starters. Uh, money donators, researchers, you know, like we, it's impossible for any of us to be involved in any group and not be considered integral to the plan of whatever that group wants to achieve. And that's, I mean, even just by nature of joining this call, which is a pain in everybody in the middle of everybody's Sunday. But let's be honest, like, we feel that like responsibility, we decide it's worth it. And it is worth it. It's worth it to a lot of other people. It's also worth it to each other. I, I love having social interaction. I think it's like going to church that I don't want to go. And then after I've gone, I'm glad I went. It's such a, it's, it's a pain every time. I don't know why my brain doesn't withhold that church is great and that I feel good for going and that I should go every week. But every time Sunday comes around, I'm like, oh, I just want to stay home today. And then I feel miserable that I didn't go. And every time I go, I feel good that I went. And so it just keeps good people down. Like the good people that we really need voices, I think almost, like you said, Chris, almost because they can become leaders and responsible and be important. I'm important at church. But a lot of times the baser side of me wishes that I wasn't important at all. And social media really encourages being phony important because it takes very little effort to get a lot of serotonin. But it's not going to make a difference in the long run. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, so my wife and I, we made the decision that uh, we, we've asked all of our friends not to take a picture of our son and put him on Facebook. We just don't want him, you know, if one day he wants to create a, a profile or whatever and do what he wants to do and put himself all over social media, that's his decision. Um, I, obviously we'll see how long that lasts. He's only eight and a half months right now. So somebody will slip, but we've had to ask people to take a picture down, but it's funny. Cause I, that serotonin, that little hit you're talking about. Um, my father came into me the other day, said, Oh, my sister also had a child. Oh, we put up a picture of my granddaughter and I got over a hundred likes by the next morning. And, and, you know, but you can't put your picture up. I'm like, those are, it's fake. It, it's not, that's not real. I mean, sure, you show a picture to somebody in person, there's a back and forth. I mean, but sometimes somebody can just come through and be like, ooh, like, 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 like. I mean, you're not really getting anybody's true attention. So, um, but I've seen him, somebody that's a, um, as Spangle likes to beat up on the, a boomer, <laughs> wouldn't even want a, a smartphone and to text. And then now it's, you're, 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 his face is like in it all the time on Facebook and doing all the things like that. I'm like, Oh my God, the thing that you used to beat, beat us up about now you're 10 times worse than a, a millennial is or maybe not Gen Z, but, um, but it, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it is weird how you, it is weird how you can take a picture and not post it online. You can keep that photo forever <laughs> and it's, it stays a photo even if it doesn't go on Instagram. It's the craziest phenomenon. Or that's fake know. news. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys remember uh, the Lou? I, I know Louis C.K. has fallen out of everybody's good graces now, but where he said you can take a video of your like a kid's school play for five seconds and then like do half an hour of just videotaping your own butthole and nobody actually watches it. So everybody will be like, cute video. I really liked it. Oh, your daughter, you know, your granddaughter's so cute. But they don't view it. And like the sad part is, is it's like kind of true. They read the first mm -hmm. sentence of a long post and they'll be like, if I agree with it, I'll hit like or heart. If it right. seemed funny, I'll hit laughy, I guess. But they aren't really engaging you. Um, <clears throat> Jacob and Christy, I uh, hate to call you guys out, but... Uh, we don't. <laughs> but you, you're so shy. We need to hear from you guys. You're both. You're both brilliant. I, I am so hurt. I've been holding so much back. All so right, much all right. content over here. Let it go. go. Let it all go, okay. Jacob. Do it. I was gonna follow that up with Christian. Go first, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm. I'm. I'm ready. I'll, I'll give two comments and then uh, I'll, I'll. I'll buy Christy about thirty seconds. All right. To think of something. Uh, the first one I thought about was. Um, uh, a little bit of what Jordan Peterson was talking about before with the uh, was brought up about bringing up goals and all that good stuff. You know, he brought up a good point in one of his uh, lectures where he said, you know, the, the danger of outlining a goal 
is because you've kind of set up the parameters that define your failure. So like, you know, setting a goal means you now know what it means to fail at that goal. So that's maybe, uh, that was my kind of thought on that uh, piece. The other thing I was going to bring up, it might have been uh, about four or five minutes ago now, but I'm going to mention it anyway. Um, we mentioned about the um, about the government and, you know, people's mindset towards it and that kind of the community. Um, it was kind of like uh, something Hody posted on Facebook uh, a couple days ago, but um, I'll go and kind of like rephrase it to where, how I interpret it. You know, most libertarians understand, that, you know, like the government writ large is like the problem, right? But the problem is, the real problem is government is composed of people that believe in the purpose and the mission of the government they're in. So you're not going to convince, you know, somebody that's, you know, serving a position out like, hey, man, you know, like, you know, your department shouldn't exist or whatever, you know, at that macro level, you know, it's going to take a little bit more of that face to face, you know, type of dialogue that, you know, that we kind of do. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely, um, I think we talked about this before. I'm more of a limited government, super small type government guy. Um, I want things more locally managed, privatized, all that good stuff. But at the same time, nobody's going to accept that unless they have that mindset that's willing to accept that their community can handle the problems. So I think that was a, one key thing that the book was kind of getting across was like, you know, if you want the community to, you know, to be something that can replace government, then wow. it's on us to become that part of that community and have that alternate. Because right now, I think Chris said something about this earlier about there really isn't a strong alternative right now to government at the community level. Because if you told somebody, you know, don't work the average person, don't worry about, you know, the government, your local community will handle it. Nine out of 10 times, they're going to be like, okay, like, like we talked earlier, I don't even know my neighbors. So how do I know, you know, they're going to have my best interest in mind. So um, that's going to take a lot of groundwork really to change that culture to where people have the mindset that they can be willing to say, okay, I trust my community more than government writ large. Cause the government writ large is kind of like the easy button answer. You know, when, when you have nothing else to fall back on, it's like, well, you know, I dissolved myself for responsibility because of the government program out there. That'll do it. You know? Whereas the hard answer is like, no, let's let's get involved and figure this out so we don't have to have the government come in and fix it for us. That was kind of my two cents on the um, two topics that I brought up so far. And now I give the floor to Christy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I just pretty much agree with what, what the, everybody has been saying. Um, just when you're with somebody face to face, be with that person. Don't be distracted by social media and all that other stuff that you get that instant serotonin hit to the brain. Um, I went to a basketball game with my brother recently last Saturday. We drove through some horrible weather to get there. Thank God we made it back in there and back in time <laughs> without killing each other. But um, he doesn't have Facebook. He doesn't have the internet or anything like that. So I don't really keep that close in touch with him. Of course, the brother that does have the internet, and Facebook and all that, I really don't keep that close in touch with him either. So. I guess, I guess one way isn't better than the other, but um, it was nice just to spend that time driving the two, two and a half hours to Indy and back and sitting in a basketball game and having fun. So I think just when you're with somebody, you're with that person, you don't, you don't be distracted by Facebook and all that other stuff while you're with them. Isn't it weird when you, when you're in that situation, it's like, you have so much in common because you came out of the same birth canal, but there's also this awkwardness where you don't quite have, <laughs> like, I have this with my siblings. It's sort of like, eh, how are you? Good. You know, thank goodness for the nieces because like, then there's like that point where we talk about the nieces or I don't know. It, it is odd with family. The, you know, Hody may be the exception here, you know, being from Utah, they have lots of family there. <laughs> but I, I think like the nuclear family and extended family has become much more fragmented. And so those muscles of family have kind of also been eroded too. I don't know if it's just me, but I sort of feel like people don't, people aren't as close to maybe their siblings as they were a hundred years ago or 50 years ago. I agree. There's almost an encouragement to disassociate with people that, that that you don't have that you don't have common ph philosophies with that being from the same birth canal isn't good enough you know that that's just some chance and 
you know, why care? At least friends are people that you chose to be with. Your family is just something that you got stuck with or that you had to be with. And I think that that's really a toxic mentality, but I think it's something that gets around because people can validate it philosophically. I think for me, my favorite part of the book, and I don't remember, maybe one of you guys will, who was the other senator that it was a Democrat that he was hanging out with in overseas? And they said, he said about that senator, we disagree on 90% of the issues, but we got along fine. We went over, we had an overseas trip talking about peace in the Middle East and, and everything went fine. And everybody in both of our Twitter feeds was talking about how we have to hate each other and expecting us to come to blows at some point. And why can't we just get along? Like, we got along fine, but somehow there's this mentality out there caused by neither one of those senators that they need to hate each other because they have differences in philosophy. I think that those get ironed out with friendship, with family, with community, as opposed to saying, I'm only forming a community, a family, a friendship with these people that are my philosophical equals. It's okay to like somebody on Facebook because you think they're funny, even if they're from the left or the right, it doesn't matter. You follow them because they're funny and that's okay. You follow them because they're your dad and that's okay. And you know, it's okay to have these relationships. Not all relationships have to be based on philosophy. They can just be based on health. This person's good for my social health. I am, I am healthier because they're in my life. And that's something that I've struggled with, especially with my new influx of friends, to be like, they don't understand why I would be friends with somebody who's a chief of police thinking what I do about the police. Well, it's because I like hanging out with that person, and they're my friend. Yes, do I hope that my ideas impact that person someday? Of course I do. But that's not my primary interest in that relationship. And it's okay for me to have a relationship with that person in the meantime. And if philosophy comes up, I'm not going to back down. But that's also not why I have that relationship and that friendship right now. You know, and, and the encouragement is for us to divide. So that was, I mean, that was like my favorite part of the whole book, because I think that that spoke to me saying, yes, it's okay for you to have friends that think differently than you. You're not supposed to be at war with everybody that's not your philosophical equal. I feel like we just have to stop catering to the lowest common denominator in society. And we, we are focusing too much on the lowest form of the human species, you know, the, the online commenter. <laughs> I think we're just like those people who are sitting there blasting his Twitter back saying, you shouldn't be friends with this. This is just a person we should not listen to. This is a person of low intelligence who doesn't understand that two people can be dis can disagree, but understand, you know, I was, I was walking to my bedroom last night and my cat, I noticed muffins. Every time I walk in my bedroom, my cat will circle in front of me and then try to guide me towards her food bowl. <laughs> and, and her food bowl's half, half full, but she still every time does that. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, does she think her food is empty? And I realize she's not thinking. She doesn't have cognition. She's acting out of a learned behavior that when he goes in here, he gives me food. I get salt, I get gratification. I get food. I get this basic need met. So if I do this every time, then, it, and it becomes instinctual. It just becomes a habit. And she's not acting out of her her conscious mind. She's acting out of instinct. And that's what makes her an animal. She's doing something that just tries to give her immediate pleasure and gratification, trying to survive. And the human animal has those basic things. And when we are commenting online, so often we're just acting out of instinct. We're not using cognition. We're not sitting there mm -hmm. thinking things through. We're just reacting. Jonathan Haidt talks about this in his book on religion and politics, uh, The Righteous Mind, You know where people are so often, think about this in your own behavior, catch yourself. You're responding to something just out of your pure bias and instinct. You know That's what a lot of last weekend was about, pure bias and instinct. I see this thing, I'm outraged, I'm going to say it. I'm going to call them you know, white supremacists. Instead of having a cognitive moment and going, well, man, this doesn't make sense, you know? And so if you're 
if you're better than a cat, if you're smarter than a cat or an animal, uh, I just, just so much of what we're doing is just, we're not, we're acting out of instinct and fear and trying to get our needs met and immediate pleasure and social media just, uh, it, it's, it's like that, that thing today where I was on Rob Kendall's show and I was talking about the local media and I have a different perspective than a lot of people. And I've worked in media for 15 years and, uh, I had the guy that I was talking about. I had a conversation with him last week and this guy just replied on, he just commented back. Like, what does a libertarian know about media? <laughs> now that guy is just a Republican boomer who doesn't know shit about me. Doesn't didn't listen to the thing. He's just acting out of, out of what, just an instinct that this person isn't in the right tribe. So therefore, how would he know? And it's just, he's just being a troglodyte. He's just being an idiot. And so I wasted 30 minutes on this guy probably today. I shouldn't do that. You know, I should just go, this person is lowest common denominator. And that's the problem with a lot of social media. We've taken the comment section of the newspaper websites and the blogs, and we put it in front of way more people on social media. And you just knew 15 years ago, 10 years ago, you don't read the comments on the blog. You just don't. Mm -hmm. And we have to start saying like this, this particular person, I'm sorry, you're not a person. If you really think this, then you're not a person of value in, in society. Like, in terms of your voice, like you reserve, you deserve dignity and respect, but your opinion does not count. Like if you are afraid, uh, if you think like Alyssa Milano thinks that a MAGA hat is the same as a white hood, this is a person whose voice should just be discounted from the public conversation until she really starts to think about what she's saying. Like once she starts saying intelligent things, then we should listen. But until then you're just, you're reacting. You're not actually having a thought. You're just reacting like my cat when I walk into my bedroom. It's why the NPC meme is so offensive to him, right? Right. Because it's so devastating. Yeah. You're just purely reactionary. So let, let's, uh, let's change it up a bit. We've had a lot of positive talk. Was there anything in the book that you disagreed with or that you, you thought uh, maybe you would word a little differently or anything you just didn't like about it because we we've had nothing but outpouring of love for the book and i would agree i think it's worth everybody's read especially if you struggle with social media or understanding people but is there anything that maybe you didn't like about it uh, i think it was brought up in the comments he doesn't get too much into the fix per se i think he shows the symptoms of what's going on um, although he kind of does close it up a little bit, um, basically, you know, you be the change. I think as I kind of said earlier, you be the change that you want to see. Um, but no, I, I think overall I, I enjoyed it and got through it pretty quickly. Um, it was easy reading. I don't think he didn't, I think, which was smart on his end. If he's trying to write the book, he didn't, it wasn't his political views. So he kind of kept a lot of that out. There's a few little sprinklings of it here and there, but it was kind of, this is something different than my my politician side. You know, this is something I'm seeing that I think is a bigger issue. Either you're liberal, conservative, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But um, this is this is a bigger issue that we need to look at. Yeah, that was a big reason that I wanted to that I liked this book and that I wanted to recommend it is that it is not a political book. It is a sociological, historical, solutions based book. It's from a definite point of view, but his point of view is not in a way that is, you know, it's not like a Jim DeMint book where he's just derailing the left because he never really gets into the left-right stuff. It, it, you know, he's probably more critical of the right in, in the media chapters. Mm -hmm. But so, you know, I that's a big reason. There wasn't a lot that I didn't like about this book, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to to raise it up and have people read it. I, th I think for me, the, uh, what you said, Hadley, the fix it section was a little to be wanting. I'm not sure that that's unintentional. I think that I think maybe the how to fix it title might be misleading more like how to shut off the negativity as opposed to how to fix the negativity. It's kind of like how I because I, I it's from the very beginning. He creates that example of the people who are yelling at him during the marathon where he's offering water 
uh, right. to the marathon runners, and they're like, don't drink it. And he references it again at the end, and I'm like, so you still, there's still no fix for those people. You just ignore those people. You just don't feed the beast. You don't feed trolls, yeah. which I think right. is kind of, I mean, it's good advice, but it's advice I'd heard before. So I'm like, oh, don't feed the trolls. Okay. You know, and, and I guess for me, that was uh, <clears throat> maybe my least favorite part. It wasn't that bad. It was just, I was really excited for, man, he's detailed so well what the problem is. Like, I was excited for all these nuances in fixing it. And his new, and his whole thing was just, just shut it off. You know, just, but, just be done yeah. with it. In some ways, there's an awareness the way that you fix it. I mean, there, that's part part of it is seeing this going. Oh wait, I'm lonely. I need to be in in my, in more community with people. Like there, it's kind of a, a hard sell to say let's fix all of society. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think awareness is a huge part of the battle, and I think the second part is leadership. I think by you know, like the the Alan Frank podcast, you know, I said to Frank, I said, this is a great podcast. You guys are really being leaders by showing people how to have conversations about big ideas in a respectful way. That's leadership. You you have to start displaying the qualities in the world that you want to see. I think that's a huge part of it is that if you if you read this book and you go, wow, this this is a problem. Like the work section is a great example. There's no way that you and I can change capitalism. Like we're not arrogant like Liz Warren or Bernie Sanders and thinking that we can change an economic system. Uh, We can only work with it. But being aware that you're probably feeling a certain way because of the, the gig economy, I think that in and of itself is a fix. And that's certainly a personal fix. I think it was like why we hate each other and how to fix it. He fixed the me hating them part. I I just maybe right. it was sky high hopes to stop them from hating us. You know, <laughs> like yeah, how, how to stop them from being demagogues right back. And and maybe there's not a fix for that part of it. But the uh, it, fixing yourself is certainly certainly the most important part. I would describe this as a self help book to anybody. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's a nitpicky thing. I mean, I'm only asking the question because we've spent an hour and 15 minutes talking about how awesome it is. So like, if there's (laughs) any little parts you didn't like, I know, uh, and this is nitpicking again, but he does that, you know how, like, if you follow, especially like presidential election cycles, if you ask them a question about like welfare, they have one example and one sentence that's always like a go-to. They're like, I'm going to say this every time. I think listening, having heard Ben Sass before, he, he does that if you talk about a certain example. He references this, you're poisoning them thing at the marathon, like anytime he talks about the divide between the left and the right, that's like his go-to. And it's smart because that way you don't say something stupid, but it does come off maybe a little bit as like, this is my talking point and I'm sticking to it. And so if, if you hear him talk about the same subject again, you're going to get the same response again. I think he talks about that interaction at the Lincoln Memorial like twice in the same book. And I'm like, okay, I get that that's like your go-to for these interactions, you know, like, uh, it, and that's the only time he even came off as politician And it's not even because he was pushing an agenda. Maybe it's just because I'm used to seeing politicians give talking points versus seeing like people in the media give talking points. And there's me saying like again, see, I need to, I need this interaction. You guys, I need it. <laughs> But yeah, that's being way nitpicky. Um, other than that, guys, I think uh, we're an hour twenty minutes into it. Let's uh, let's wrap up. What are you? Uh, let's talk. Let, let's go ahead and give a preview of the next book, The Libertarian Mind. Hadley, I know you've already started, so no spoilers. But uh, what are you guys? What are you guys only, excited what, like six, for? Six seven hundred pages, so I I got to get ahead of this. Oh no, a slow reader. <laughs> what are you guys uh, excited for with the with the next book? I'll let so, somebody else start. So I have, you know, if you're complaining about the size, of, you could get the Libertarian Reader that Bose put together, and it's only twice as long. <laughs> uh, I, I've This is a revised and updated edition of his original book called Libertarianism, which I read and was very impactful for me early on in my libertarianism. 
Uh, I know David Bowes is a controversial figure now, co- considering he criticized the Mises Institute and Tom Woods at the last Students for Liberty. But I think what he does, I think it's, I didn't want to choose for a new Liberty with Murray Rothbard uh, because it seems cliche at this point. I, I have chosen the first two titles to be intentionally provocative towards libertarians. We got an Instagram message when I promoted this book club saying Ben Sass isn't a libertarian. And I said, so what? Uh, so because good ideas don't, uh, good ideas aren't exclusive to just the Mises Institute, which I respect them. I respect Tom Wood. I respect Murray Rothbard. And I think we should read For a New Liberty at some point because it's very good. Um, but I wanted to do a libertarian book. And this is one that I think is fairly complete and really doesn't try to come at it from a uh, here's the purest anarchist philosophy. It tries to kind of think in terms of how we're living in a society and how do we apply libertarianism to mo- the modern times. Uh, so that's that's the reason that I chose it for the third book uh, for, you know, we've got I, I probably chose the longest book for the shortest month, which is why we kind of put the word out. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it is, it is, uh, it can be sometimes dry, but, uh, I think it's worth it. Um, I think for the third month, I'm open to suggestions. I think, uh, there's a couple books that I've, that I've started lately that I think are really, that might be good reads. Um, Rules for Radicals by Saul Linsky. I think it really gives you a good insight into the left. Uh, Identity by Francis Fukuyama talks about identity politics and how bad it is and not from Francis Fukuyama is a, a if we chose that it'd make the collapsitarian's head explode because he's he's a council on foreign relations guy. He's a globalist, but he's wrote he's written a book saying this is how harmful identity politics is on both sides. And I've, I've found that to be kind of interesting. Uh, manufacturing consent by a um, Noam Chomsky. It's it's another long one, but it's a great framework of how modern propaganda takes place. So those are just a couple suggestions. Um, uh, if we wanted to do another libertarian book, I'm interested in reading Crisis and Leviathan. Uh, it basically talks about here's how the government has grown in America, and usually it's through war. Uh, another book that we could take a look at is Healing Our World with Mary Ruart. That was very very uh, informative to me in 2013, and I'd love to reread the new, the new updated edition. So, those are just some some uh, ideas for the next couple months. Uh, so, if you're interested in joining the book club, or if you want to recommend a title, then Hody and I are all ears. If you're just listening to this, going, "Hey, I didn't know this existed," Hody, how can people get in touch and get engaged in the book club? So you can uh, unfortunately still contact me on social media <laughs> under Hody Johns. Uh, but actually, the best thing you can do for yourself is getting off of social media and connect with us on Goodreads is the website that we're using. Uh, search for the We Are Libertarians book club. You should find it pretty easily. Uh, it's there's a op- link on the front. There, there's a link on the front page of wearelibertarians.com too. There you go. And it's really easy to join. It's actually an open join, so you don't have to, like, answer, give us a password or say anything like that. And it's open join on purpose. Like, we appeal, in spite of the name We're Libertarians, we appeal to a lot of non-libertarians just because of the content we put out. And we're not demagogues about it. And we're open to other points of view. And we're going to constantly be reading things like this that are not just from a libertarian scope. One of the things that I'm excited about, since we're talking about what we're looking forward to going forward, I know nothing about the libertarian mind. I've heard a lot of good things, and I haven't read it. Shame on me. I'm excited to to read it uh, and learn about some of that. Um, but we're kind of rotating between books that like the Wall Network guys select and the community. So um, the Lib- uh, libertarian mind was actually a community suggestion. And so we're going to rotate between what the community suggests and what kind of the wall network guys are reading right now. And that's so that's really incentive to get involved if because we're going to read some books that you suggest as well for the network. Um, So, yeah, connect with us at Goodreads. Um, This last book loved. I'm sure I will love the next book. I find that even books that I hate, I am able to take a lot away from it. And maybe that's just because. 
I love all I love all those books that your history professor forced you to read is the best way to say it. And I even just love talking about him, even if I despise the author. Like, I think F. Scott Fitzgerald is one of the worst people, and I think Great Gatsby is full of bad ideas. But I could talk about it for hours just because I find it fascinating. And so maybe we'll come across a book that you hate and dislike, but we encourage you to join, you know, join and talk about it and uh, have fun with us. You get to be a part of this conversation. I'd be excited even if it was only me. If I'm the only guy who reads the book, I'm still going to do this because I love talking about books. And so I'm you just, just excited. Love talking. Have, I do. I do. Yappity yap. <laughs> but, you know, get, having five people that uh, read and got involved and decided to communicate with us, I, I'm excited for that. And I'm excited to see us grow. So, yeah, join us on Goodreads. Anything from the rest of you guys that you guys are looking forward to with the next book and maybe the future of Goodreads, the Weary Libertarians Book Club in general? Just trying to get back into reading, period. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah uh, I think that's, yeah, that's like the it. hardest thing is like learning how to read again. <laughs> <laughs> Christy, you're not the only one, but I'm glad you said it. I think people <laughs> might feel embarrassed, but like, I can tell, here's like again, I can tell that so many people that we're getting libertarian NPCs and reading is the way to yeah. stop that. And we need to not be NPCs because then we're no different. We need to have real ideas. The reason that, I mean, the Republican Party before Lincoln was pulling in like 2 3%, same as the Libertarian Party now. But when they said, oh, this country is in crisis, we need people with real ideas, that's when they turned to the Republicans because they knew they had real ideas. If we're NPCs, our ideas are no more valid than the Green Party's, Independence, socialist parties communist parties constitution parties we just we just become the same mindless dribble you know it's barely even a third party at this point it could be fourth or fifth very easily and so i think reading is one of the ways to stop that sorry to hijack it go ahead hadley or jacob no that's good uh i'm looking forward to it like i said i think i'm about 125 pages into the libertarian mind at this point and i find it very informative again very new to even the libertarian thinking um I think uh, as many people, Gary kind of piqued my interest. And um, luckily I searched a podcast and or, uh, on a Google podcast there and found you guys. So it brought me in. And But r l learning more, and I do like the theory or the thought to, you know, read libertarian books, but also read different ideas as well, because you really can't formulate a good argument if you don't understand where the other person is coming from. Um so if you have your ideas and that's all you have, that's great. But if you don't understand where somebody else stands, um, that, and now I'm catching myself saying, um, Cody. <laughs> once you start, you're like, oh, yeah, there's there like is. again. Yeah. Okay, just keep talking. <laughs> I need to stop. So Hody's, Hody's infecting us with his basic <laughs> white girlness. Uh. Uh. <laughs> so So I and I think I think it's really good, and it, and it gives me a. Uh, a basis understanding of what really libertarianism is because I don't think I've gotten a good idea from listening to the podcast uh, on the views, but this is diving more, this is diving deeper into it. Um, and I like that. And I hope, you know, that's also piquing my interest of maybe trying to read Locke or other uh, thought, uh, other thoughts. So, and it was kind of interesting Oh, now I'm not going to get into the book cause I'm already uh, part way into it, but <laughs> I'm very much. Yeah, yeah. save it for the fourth, the fourth <laughs> Sunday of next month. <laughs> yes. So uh, I, I'm very much looking forward to finishing the rest of it and chatting about that. And uh, wherever the uh, book club goes from there, it's it's good to get me thinking uh, outside of my normal work and friend environment and start challenging my uh, my mind a little bit. Jacob, you get the last word, man. Oh, man, I, I'm honored. I'll try not to uh, fumble or say too many, too many ums or likes. Um, <laughs> no, I'm most excited just because most of you know that I'm pretty new to libertarianism in general. So that's the same reason I joined the research team was just trying to get kind of that behind the scenes outside of the normal narrative on what's going on. And so reading something that kind of helps me pin down what libertarian means, um, I'm really looking forward to getting into. Uh, one last comment I'll make since people are talking about reading books and picking them back up again um there's a meta book i read recommend called make it stick if you guys haven't read that one yet uh it's basically a it's a book on how to remember what you read 
later on. Like mm. a, basically, I like how to recall information better from books you have read. So it's a, a book about reading books, but I highly recommend it if, uh, if maybe now's the time to get a hold of that book before we do a whole book club. You know, <laughs> uh, might be just good fodder for the background just to help everyone else out kind of retain some of that knowledge they get from the reading material. Other than that, what's it called? To, uh, reading it. It's called Make It Stick. I can send it to you uh, the group message and then we can stick it on Goodreads or something. Okay, Make It Stick. Yeah, with the, like an orange <laughs> chip heath and with the orange cover. Uh, I think so. I thought you were saying. I have, a, I, have a, I have a blue cover version, so I'm. Does that have I duct tape on the cover? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got yeah, it for a dollar. The science of successful story, learning. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'll send yeah, you yeah, a yeah. so we can put that one out too. But um, yeah, it, like I said, it's, a, it's a, a book about reading books. But it helped me a lot for sure. So, but that's all I got. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining and being part of this. Uh, if you're listening to this, it means you've already subscribed to Patreon. So we just thank you so much for your donation and allowing us to get together. Uh, please join us. It's going to be the fourth Sunday every month. If you're reading the books, please be a part of this conversation. Uh, fourth Sunday every month, uh, 12 o'clock Pacific, 3 o'clock Eastern. And we'll talk about the previous book of the month as well as. Uh, we're actually going to decide pretty soon what the next book is for the month following. That way, all of you uh, boomer library people can have the book in plenty of time. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry, Christy. That was an unfair dig. But uh, again, thank you all so much for being here and uh, look forward to seeing y'all next month. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>